Uh, we're going to get started here. Uh, welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful lunchtime and had the opportunity to um, check in with each other and reflect on the programming this morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Eyring. I'm the Executive Dir Director of TCG, Theater Communications Group. Thank you. Um, as I, I think you heard, this morning I spent at another TCG pre-conference uh, of about 40 TCG member theaters who are part of an Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Institute. And what they've been doing, we actually have one cohort that started three years ago, and they're, they're sort of graduating this year, and a whole new cohort that started today. Um, and we're really grateful to the funders who have helped support that, including Mel the Mellon Foundation. Um, but what we've been doing is trying to go deeper in our work to dismantle the systemic inequities that have plagued our country and our theater community for so many decades. Um, listening to the panel here just before we broke for lunch, these questions of equity, justice, human rights, they cross all borders and they're crucial. Um, they're of crucial importance to theater makers everywhere. And I think that's part of the reason why we're, we're all here today and at this conference. So for those who don't know, TCG is the national organization for theater in the US with a longstanding commitment to global citizenship. Our vision, in short, is to make a better world for theater and a better world because of theater. And more and more, we think about that second part of the sentence, um, making a better world because of theater. So the national conference this year has a special theme, and that's Theater Nation. And what we're doing is bringing together artists, theater staffs, funders, and trustees. We're going to have over 1,000 attendees, almost a record breaker. And tomorrow afternoon, we will all come together at the Renaissance Hotel. Um, it will be our first time together. We're going to hear from Anna DeVere Smith to kick it off, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so um, when we started planning our conference uh, in, in 2015 is when we really got going with the planning, we knew a few things. We knew that Washington would be filled with the electricity of an election year. We didn't know quite how complicated this election year was going to be. Um, <laughs> But we wanted to take advantage of that. And by the way, apropos of the discussion earlier, tomorrow morning we have 200 people going to Capitol Hill to meet with their elected officials. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of um, issues that affect the arts community. And one of them is immigration policy, particularly as it affects artists. Um, we knew that we would be going deeper into, into our commitment around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we knew we wanted to make the conference more inclusive and engaging to the global theater community. Uh, this conference also coincides with the formation of the Global Theater Initiative, which you may have heard about this morning as a collaboration between the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics and TCG. So this Global Pre-Conference is our first really big project together. And we're having a great time. And I'd like to ask Derek to come back and say a few words about the Global Theater Initiative. Great, thanks, Teresa. I'll be sure you heard me talk a lot already, but I did just want to um, fill in a little bit more about GTI. Um, uh, and I, I guess to echo again that it's sort of this, this feels like the, the dream of GTI, this gathering itself. Um, through the alignment and, of programming and resources, uh, GTI uh, seeks to serve as a hub of global exchange with three core areas of focus, connecting practitioners with resources, knowledge, and partnerships to strengthen their work, uh, promoting cultural collaboration as essential for international peace and mutual understanding, and innovating new strategies to maximize the global theater field's opportunities and impact. Um, so all of that is, you know, we're working very hard not to be redundant, but to be additive. There's an enormous amount of amazing work happening already. How do we have something to contribute to amplify that work and to forge new connections? Um, importantly, GTI also serves as the collaborative leadership of the U.S. Center of ITI, the International Theater Institute, which many of you know about. Um, there'll be opportunities during the main conference. When is the session? Do we Friday. Friday, thank you. Um, uh, f Friday to have a, a deeper um, window into ITI, but I wanted to um, acknowledge uh, the Director General of ITI, Tobias Bianconi, who's here with us. Tobias, are you in the room right now? Uh, 
if he's not, he will be back. Um, it's uh, uh, special and important that he's here. Um, and also the leadership on the U.S. side for, man for many years of, of my colleague and collaborator, um, Amelia Cachapero, as the director from the U.S. Um, and as part of our GTI core team. Um, so that's a little more about GTI, and, are we, and we're going to Amelia to introduce the next thing, or yeah, are you saying? Absolutely. Great. Okay. So uh, Amelia, uh, come on up and introduce um, our next session. There you are. Hello, you all. Um, very full day. I wanted to give also a shout out to our international guests, who many of whom have traveled hours and hours and hours to be here. Uh, and that commitment to come and join in the conversation with us today is greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, as Teresa said, uh, TCG is deeply committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And diversity, our core values are uh, diversity, artistry, activism, and global citizenship. So actually, this panel coming up folds very right into uh, our mission, our core values, the way we think and work. Uh, there are so many parallel issues and conversations uh, in the equity, diversity, and inclusion conversations that parallel and align with conversations that happen around uh, global exchange. Um, and a lot of those are, are coming up today. Uh, one of our activities, uh, international activities, or to do uh, delegations where we bring groups of U.S. theater professionals to meet with their colleagues uh, in other parts of the world. And we've brought people to Fujairah and the Emirates, uh, to Colombia, uh, to Sudan, uh, and also uh, to Havana, to Cuba. We recently brought a group uh, of which Sanja Parks, who is moderating the panel, was on the delegation. Sanja is supported by our Fox Foundation uh, residency program for actors. Uh, um, and she was there watching this international festival uh, of very renowned uh, and fabulous work. Uh, and she had this um, insight, this glimmer, uh, that where are the Afro-Cuban artists here? They're not represented, and we are in Havana. Um, and so it went into a deeper conversation. I know that Teresa connected uh, Sanja up with uh, Afro-Cuban artists in Havana, and we kept this conversation going and felt that it was important to have uh, this window in uh, into the African diaspora uh, and looking and thinking about race, colonization, and art all combined together. Uh, so that's the genesis of this, and I'm going to turn it over to Sanja. So please take it away. Thank you, Amelia. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, GTI and uh, Georgetown in the lab for this opportunity to have this conversation this afternoon. Everybody have a good lunch? Yes. <laughs> so um, we have a very distinguished panel here. I am not going to read their bios. Please open your um, uh, packet and their uh, numerous achievements are listed there. There are some very accomplished folks. So um, I will, however, let them introduce themselves and we'll just go down the line. Hi, I'm Julius Tenen, uh, President of Production and Development of Juvie Productions in Los Angeles, California. Hi, my name is Josette Buschelmingo. I'm British born, living in Sweden. I am the artistic director for Riksteatern's Tusttheater, which is the sign language department and I'm also a member of an organization called Turk, which translated means push, mm -hmm. and that organization really is the gathering of Afro-Swedish cultural workers. Hello, <laughs> 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 uh, my name is Lloyd Nyigadzino, I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm currently the national coordinator for the Zimbabwe Center of the International Theater Institute. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Manuel Viveros. I am an actor, I'm a professor, work in Buenaventura, Colombia, and this is my first time speaking English in front of a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I have a problem, Olga. <laughs> yeah, I'm Olga Garay, English, and I'm the translator, though he doesn't need one. <laughs> <laughs> and then joining us via Skype is uh, Nikkei Joda. Nikkei. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all okay? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Really great to be here via Skype, though I would have liked to be there in person. I, I'm Nigerian, I am British descent, and I live in the UK. I'm 
the new incoming director for the Afro Vibes Festival in the UK, and I also am setting up a Pan-African interdisciplinary performing arts market, which will take place in Bloemfontein, South Africa, for people from across the continent to be able to share their work to the rest of the world and tour their work and increase business opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So as, as Amelia said, this conversation really started with a trip to Havana, where um, I noticed a, 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 a lack, um, a lack of representation. And that sparked a greater question in me of uh, where, where else are um, Africans of the diaspora not being represented? Is that something that is happening globally? And if so, um, what strategies are being implemented in the, the varying countries that perhaps we can, can, can collectively use together to combat that, that lack of diversity or that lack of representation? And so this panel is really a, a, a representation of the many countries of the diaspora where um, uh, Africans are living, working artists um, and have been living, working artists and are doing art that speaks specifically to us, for us, and about us. Um, and so we started with the question of um, how are we making certain that our voices as Africans of the diaspora are being heard and recognized in our respective countries and can what, some, what are some of the strategies that we are individually implementing, and can those strategies be implemented globally? And so with that, I'm going to open it up to the panel, and we're just going to have a discussion. And afterwards, we will have ample time for questions, too. Absolutely. Our world has become smaller because of the internet, right? <laughs> so then uh, this whole notion of inclusion should seem kind of pretty the demographics are shifting here in our country. And so then it seems that then there should be more inclusion. Here in the States, we talk a lot about diversity. And that's a great word. Mm -hmm. But if you don't put the I, if you don't use the word, the I word, inclusion, then what does diversity really mean here in the States where we do have great opportunity to, um, you know, voice our opinions, uh, uh, be involved in the conversation and 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 the like. So it's it's really important that as we see our world changing, that then y you look not just here in the states but worldwide, and then yet the voices of uh, Afro Americans and Blacks all across the the, the globe are still not being heard. Um, I think for us here in the States, and for myself and my wife particularly, some of you may be familiar with her. Her name is Viola Davis. Uh, and <laughs> some of you may know who she is. I never heard of her. Uh, yeah, you never heard of her. Sweet, but, sweet. But, but we, you know, we, 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 we started our production company because there was a lack of roles even for her, someone of a great talent who went to school and went to Juilliard and did all the work and all that. Then you get to Hollywood and all that. Then. You know, she's been on a stage screen, and then you get to Hollywood, and you realize there's not much there. So then what you have to do is you have to do what? You have to create. You have to find a way. And I was asked a question uh, um, a few months back. What, what is some of the challenges as an African-American producer you face? And I said, inclusion. I mean, you know. We talk about what we're gonna, how we're going to do this, but then we're always kind of left on the peripheral. And I always think you have to ask the questions. You always have to say, you know, this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. I want to work with people who see our vision. We all have a vision. Mm -hmm. And so we want to work within. We want to, our vision to be seen, but we want to work with folks who get the vision, who catch it, and say, "Okay, let's do this." And we can be, we can have a more inclusive, artistic society that way. And I think that going into the schools, Viola and I feel like going into our schools, and especially in the impoverished areas throughout the country, that don't get funding, that don't uh, 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 have opportunities for kids to be in music arts or theater arts and all that. We feel like here in our own country. Those are areas where we really need to go so we can find our next, our next generation of artists. Mm -hmm. um, and through our foundation, that's what we want to do. We want to target those places that really want to give these kids opportunities 
And here in the States, that could be one of the ways where we could expose kids to the arts in a different way so then they become better citizens because they want to go to school now. So then the, the things shift because they want to go to school, the grades get better, they find something they love, they can be citizens, and then they can do something that's incredible. So that's, that's part of kind of what we want to do to, to shift voices and that kind of thing. Thank you, Julius. Yeah, I think the, the, the point that you made about the next generation of, of artists and, and audiences is really important. It's an aspect, I think, that doesn't get looked at very mm -hmm. often. Uh, hi, everyone. I think what's important uh, in the question you asked is I wanted to place a context. Uh, I am a black British woman. I am not a Swede. Uh, and I actually mean not the vegetable. I actually mean a person. <laughs> but that's the British side of my humor coming out. But for me, what's uh, very important is to contextualize Sweden. Sweden has a very particular image of itself, and it also has a national and global image of itself. We have succeeded in doing extraordinary things when it comes to equality, particularly between the uh, genders, between between men and women. We have a very strong uh, uh, human rights record as well as everything is questionable, I know, but also um, we also have a very um, strong child-based uh, law and support network and of course our welfare service is one of the ones certainly been admired for many years, but also Sweden has a history. Sweden has an Afro-Swedish history. There are blacks that live there and I use the word politically. It is registered from the late early 1500s where the first blacks to arrive in Sweden. Sweden has still slave castles. Mm -hmm. We were part of the gold and the wood trade. And of course we have our own history concerning the race biology as well as onwards into all sorts of rather peculiar situations which I won't <laughs> go into. But that context is very important. Uh, there are two uh, things that I think is also important. is also about investment. Mm -hmm and how you invest in the future. And as a phrase that you like, is I'm, I'm tired of being invited to uh, the museum of my life. Mm -hmm. I am tired of being a guide to my own life. I am tired of being asked to build, to paint, to give stories, to give ideas, to give input, and then I can't even get into my own museum. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of it, regardless of whether I sit on a national theater or I sit with an independent organization. I don't want that anymore. It cannot happen anymore. We must take ownership ourselves. Um, I think one of the things also as well is a level of uncomfortableness. What is in the room when we are sitting on this panel? Really? Because talent, history, um, possibility, capability is not on the agenda for me anymore. But if we can or should we or will we or can we, we can. So it's not about that. And my, the rest of my colleagues that are here can uh, vouch for that. There are two strategies really that are being used and I'm very proud because the theater that I represent uh, the Riksteatern, which is the national touring theater of Sweden. I have uh, my CEO, who's right at the back, Magnus Aspergrian, uh, who's winking away, and also um, Yamam, uh, who's at the head of our equality policy. One of the first strategies that my theater is doing is now to begin to create a policy, a policy that is going to look at using law, that is legislation that exists via the UN, via the race equality laws across both the United Kingdom and United States, and in fact, um, laws that are also including uh, census, uh, statics, statistics, other types of information that can help um, theater makers make the right decisions, because many theaters want to, but the um, laws and structures that exist aren't there to help us. Um, what's important about this is that it's not just for us in the theater, it is for every arts institution. What's very important in Sweden as well, we can only, um, how can we say, positively discriminate via um, age and gender, nothing else. That's the measurement systems that we're able to use in Sweden at this point. And this policy is there to break that and open it out. So I'm very proud to know that my theater is beginning to do that. And the difference is, is that it is the CEO who's doing it. The government have asked very nicely in Swedish, <laughs> Would you be so kind to fulfill your political remit? It is still up to the artistic director and the CEO to deliver that. And if they don't deliver it because they don't feel like it, don't like it, or they're afraid, then it's something else. But my CEO is doing it. Good on you, Magnus. <laughs> No, one of the things in Sweden as well is that our history, not only because of everything else, but also what we did as a theater is we really pushed language. 
uh, because of the different, um, the change of the demograph in the country, we went really focused on language, whether it was Bosnian, Pashiska, Persian languages, we focused on language, Swedish, Finnish, we focused on language, and we saw very clearly in 2016 this was not going to work. We needed something bigger, richer, broader, much more long-lasting, and this new policy, as scary as it is, is going to change things. It will make the other theatres sit, uh, sit up. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one area of strategy, uh, and I'm along for the ride, that's mm -hmm. for sure. The other area that we're looking at, which is really why I'm here, is also an organization called Trik, which translated in English means push. And that organization really is there to um, gather together Afro-Swedes. And our strategy really, which is what several of our colleagues will talk about, is actually gathering together. And there's something that happens when we gather together. Mm. Something changes in the room when we gather together. People become more uncomfortable, <laughs> a little bit afraid, nervous. Why? Is there something wrong? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> there is something wrong, and it has to be changed, and that wrongness is something that we must own. So that organization, Trik, PUSH, is there to give advocacy, is there to give uh, artistic support. It's also there to, um, to be able to support uh, Afro-Swedish colleagues when we come to positions of conflict within other institutions. And we have also put together a complete catalogue that documents all of the Afro-Swedish artists in Sweden so that arts institutions can get hold of them. Uh, these are two of the main strategies that we are dealing with at the moment, and each has their pluses and minuses. Thank you, Josette. You're Thank welcome. you, Lloyd. Thank you. Uh, I'll respond to the question mm -hmm. by saying, what are the effects of colonization uh, in Zimbabwe theater. Uh, the effects that we have seen or witnessed in Zimbabwe was that um, when our colonizers or the masters mm -hmm. uh, were putting up everything when they were in our countries, they did what they called colonial theaters and then open spaces for people mm -hmm. like us to go and entertain ourselves. Mm -hmm. So after independence, we got our independence in 1980 Zimbabwe. Uh, these structures still remain the same. The white folks, what you call the people of color in America, it's actually the opposite in Zimbabwe. Because I started to implement these strategies, I think the white people community has been driven away from Zimbabwe, and then they are becoming the people of color, because the black uh, guys dominate a lot. But uh, the effects are still that they still own those spaces. And we are still in those open halls. <laughs> Like one of them, if I'm going to do a theater, we don't even have lights, six lights. I was the show last time, two weeks ago. There were not si six lights, I mean these <laughs> six lights, for the theater. And they're saying it's a professional theater venue. So you see some of the effects. And then the strategies that we started to, to implement is ITI, to see how best can we voice the black voice, as much as we are the majority, how can we then voice and take our space? Uh, it's through training now. Because even if uh, the, the non-governmental organization, uh, civic organizations, uh, the corporate, uh, most of them are being headed by white people. So even if you go there with a brilliant proposal or stuff like that, they need to see a white face or white name. If over the production that you want to do, it's better be a white colleague who submitted that to get the funding. But I mean, in 2011, I mean, uh, Matt Chapman from Delate, and also the Delate School, uh, they started offering Zimbabweans a one-year training scholarship to every, every, every year to one deserving Zimbabwean to go and study in the US and then go back and implement whatever that they're going. So we saw that is an opportunity to start building ourselves and to be able to speak for ourselves uh, and forget about those, um, let me say, white minorities in Zimbabwe who are not opening up their spaces for us to utilize. No, we're doing our art for art's sake. We need to tell our stories that people are dying of starvation. I mean, you're talking of migration. A lot of Zimbabweans, you might not hear them, but they're migrating to South Africa. People are being killed. People are being raped. You know, people are going to the UK. But I'm saying some of the strategies that we're implementing also is ITI is to try and train as lot young people that we can, and then also grab spaces that we can then build and, you know, share our stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I can say for now. Thank you, Lloyd. Hey, hello. Well, um, okay, I don't know if 
was great or bad that our country always has a um, government who has centralism in the last 80 years and that uh, make that all the African Colombian people lives in isolation. Yep. Uh, but after the Obama's election as a president, my country tries to copy everything. <laughs> and well, in the last maybe eight years, 10 years, all the African Colombian people are fashion. So we are fashion now. <laughs> okay. uh, what does mean? <coughs> now uh, we have festivals, music festivals and arts festivals uh, based in the African Colombian culture. But that's great, the idea that we are just good for dance and sing, mm -hmm. and no more. And that's not good always because I've, um, okay, um, at the same time. At the same time, uh, my country uh, signed some commercial trades with the ASEAN countries, and now we need a great place in the Pacific coast to work. This place is Buenaventura, where I live. And the country discovered this place and knows that we have gold, coltan, oil, and also people, a lot of people, African Colombian people. And now we are trying to show them, to show to everybody that we can do many things than sing and dance. Mm -hmm. uh, I work in the first one, a professional school for the Pacific Coast. Uh, this is important, I think, because we're going to try to show to ourselves is the first one a strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, try to tell tell ourselves that we can do many things, mm -hmm. different things, and good things. Um, that's the first one. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I have other ideas, that. but the first one is change the mind or minds because when I have students that comes, um, sometimes they know don't believe. Um, that they could go until they finish or the students and get a diploma. And all the time we have told them about the importance that they have to study to change their environment. And they understand, I have two or three stories later, I'm gonna tell you about how our students are changing their neighbors, mm -hmm. are changing their lives, changing their families. And that's very, very important mm -hmm. to this space. Thank you, Manuel. And Nikkei, our colleague, who's joining us via Skype, will come back. Nikkei? Yeah, um, I think in England it's kind of interesting because I said it early when we sort of had our prep session that the Black British voice is becoming quite strong. And I mean, while I think there's a real effort on a number of organizations' parts, organizations like the Arts Council and British Council and Film Council, there's a number of organizations that are responsible for distributing funds that are really keen to sort of see these shifts. And I think it's sort of been supported by law. We've got the Single Equality Act that really means that if you're a public body in receipt of public funds, you have to demonstrate that you're, you're diverse. You're looking at diversity and equality in terms of the work that you're doing, in terms of the audiences and who you work with. And, you know, it really sort of came into fruition in 2010, and I think people are still getting their head around what does that really mean on the ground. But I really feel very confident that there's a will and there's a real mm -hmm. desire by a number of people to kind of kind of roll the sleeves up and get things going. And I'm not saying by any stretch that it's, it's perfect. I mean, I, I see the challenges on a, on a daily basis. And I think that um, having those sort of initiatives in the, those sort of legal duties um, in, in, in place really allows for people to kind of be bold and take more risks. Mm -hmm. I think the, the issue that we've often had along diverse work is people don't like to take risks. They see it as risky. They don't understand it. There seems to be a singular narrative of what black is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I lived in America, I lived in New York for about 12 years, and I grew tired of trying to explain to people that Africa is a continent, and I'm <laughs> West African, and naturally, it's very different to 
you know, a Southern African aesthetic or mentality or culture. You know, even within Nigeria itself, there's a number of cultures and identities within those cultures. And, you know, I remember hearing George Bush saying, Africa is a very poor country. <laughs> and somebody corrected him and said, it's a very, it's, it's a continent. And he said, oh, whatever it is, it's really poor. And I thought, well, actually, we're really not. But I think there's a singular narrative about Africa. There's this whole narrative about it's poor, that things that are coming out of Africa aren't valued in the same way. They're not given the same... They're not given the same sort of, like, meeting place or a starting point. Mm -hmm. People always see it as less fun. Mm -hmm. And I think all of this needs to be looked at. And, Julius, you picked upon it when you talked about the schools and about looking about how one needs to start including. But I think it really goes back to... Schools, what are, the, what are the young people looking at in school? I mean, I, when I was at the Arts Council, I remember a number of people who were working in education said, all we seem to get going to schools are African drummers and African dancers. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? And I said, well, of course there is. But they didn't really know how to find it. They didn't really know how to package it to teachers. So I think there's a starting point even from the schools. Mm -hmm. And then when you go up to the universities, it's like who decides on what's in that canon? Mm -hmm. Who decides on who are the masters that they're studying in terms of what is great theatre? And who decides on of the framing of theatre? Mm -hmm. Because the framing of theatre by a Western standard is very different from how we would frame theatre in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our theatre can happen outdoors and we wouldn't have the same rules around what makes theatre mm -hmm. theatre. Mm -hmm. And it's not often acknowledged because people would just say it's community or they wouldn't really try to understand the context in which the work was made. So I think, for me, I think people need to travel more. I think they need to see work outside of seeing everything in America or in Europe. They need to go to different countries and experience festivals and theatre and art making and working more with people on the ground and it will start to display, dispel some of the myths and even insecurities about working with people who are different mm -hmm. and, and this is part of why I felt quite passionate about setting up the Pan-African Performing Arts Market on the continent because I kind of want to dispel, display, dispel people's myths about what they think of Africa because everyone in their head has this idea of what Africa is. I mean, one time when I was living in the States, some of my friends said they wanted to follow me one year to Nigeria, and I sort of said, yep, I arranged it all with my family over there. And then my boss at the time said to me, they've got a question to ask you, and they're not really sure how to ask you. And he said, but I have to be there for this. And they said to me, how will we get from the airport to your mum's house? And I said, what do you mean? They said, all the cars and buses? And I said, well, Oh, my goodness, no. Of course there's cars and buses, and they thought it was all sort of Tarzan, basically. And these are people that I felt were quite, you know, worldly and, you know, open-minded. But there is this kind of mystery around Africa that needs to be smashed a bit. Because what I'm finding now, working on this African festival, is a lot of the sort of Africans that were raised in Africa, they don't recognise themselves in some of the African narratives that are out there. So that causes a little bit of a... A splinter, if you like, because they're like, well, that's not really talking to me, and I can't relate to that. Mm -hmm. So I think really thinking about the, the multiple the multiple narratives and how we shift what is currently being said. And I agree with I can't remember who said it that we we need to have it said in our own voice. I think mm -hmm. just like you said, mm -hmm. we need to sort of tell our narratives mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. to get our stories out there in the way that we need the stories to be heard. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point that you're making, UK, about self-perception and changing not just um, the 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 perception of 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 us by others, but of us by us is a yeah. is an absolutely um, essential ingredient. And Jose, if you would please talk a little bit about your production. Of, yeah. Uh, Oh, yes. yes. Now, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh -huh. No. Um, yeah, I'll talk about a production. Uh, can I do the test? Can I do the question, the arms in the air test? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. How many of you here have heard of a production, A Raisin in the Sun? Right. In 2016, Sweden did its first production of A Raisin in the Sun. Sink, let, it, let it sink in. <laughs> well done. Now, all credit to you. Again, my CEO is up there. Um, it was Riksteatern together with the other three theatres that did that production. 
Um, and what's very important about it is, apart from the door that Lorraine Hansberry gives us to all her counterparts, her histories, um, it is for myself as a black British woman, uh, having seen the place so many times, to have been in a room full of Afro-Swedish actors, because I think this is also about legacy. It is about the, the role model. It is about what's being taught in schools, so that the, these plays, this play, this, this seminal piece of work, whether you love it or hate it, this seminal piece of work was not taught. In some instances, and you know, I have to say this very carefully, some of the actors in the company had not heard of her. The, the journey, the, I, can't, I can't begin to describe the journey of loss, of joy, of celebration that happened when that production took place. And all of you out there know what it's like the first time you see that work that speaks directly to you. But this wasn't just on that level. The audiences sold out, 48 performances across Sweden and Finland sold out, gone, dust, toast, reviewed. I mean, we were fried. It was amazing. I mean, fried in a good way, not fried in a... They were like, oh, after that big speech, you were all fried? No, um, no it was absolutely extraordinary. Um, but the, the, I think for me, the other thing is about legacy and education investment, because those actors had to understand on different levels at that time that they were Afro-Swedish. Mm -hmm. They will never be Cinderella. They will never be Pippi Longstocking. They will never do that. And that is not negative. Mm -hmm. But the day you realize that is a, door, is, a, is, a, is a bulb that comes in. It's something that shifted in the room. I was not experienced enough to be able to lead it. All I could do as a director is walk with them on that journey. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I could not relate to it. I'd seen the play. I knew of Lorraine. I knew of James Bolt. I knew of these things. Um, but something deeper, I think, was also <laughs> The resonance of the play itself, not just to our audiences, because it's about our audiences, but also those Afro-Swedish actors. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a white role there as well, for those who may not know. But for the Afro, for the white actor in that piece, to be in a room for the first time with all Afro-Swedish actors, mm -hmm. for actors to come into the makeup room, and I know this is really cheap, but coming to the makeup room, and normally what is, you know, you're doing some play and someone goes, oh, so what are we going to do with your hair? <laughs> you know, or <laughs> would you like these tights? And so, you know, wrong color to all these things that were happening. And for the first time, our makeup department that asked a rather dubious question, which I won't say now, but she understood very quickly that I would have to do something different. So she went out and brought in um, an Afro-Swedish makeup group that taught her how to do black makeup. Now, some people would say, well, yet yeah, she had to bring her in and she wasn't employed in the building, but she made that first step of realization that I am now out, this is not my territory. Uh, the second thing maybe was watching actors come into themselves and know that every line they spoke, every look they gave, every gesture of love and triumph and joy was for them. Mm. They didn't have to, it wasn't Juliet. It wasn't Hedda Gabler, where somehow you had to fit yourself into some kind of corset, whatever that corset was. Mm. I could just speak and be. I could just speak and be, and it would resonate way, way beyond. So this was also a raisin in the sun, or as we say in Swedish, en druvan i solen. And it was done and spoken in Swedish. I cannot even begin to uh, thank and celebrate what happened in that room, but it was also quite difficult to. Yeah, the, 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 the idea that in 2016 there are uh, black people who have never seen or heard of raisin still boggles my mind. But that is the, the, the question that we're, we're being faced with right now. And it goes back to what Manuel was saying about training and, and the next generation of artists and having, um, I think, uh, Nikkei, um, you worked on a project as well, archiving lots of the, the African, uh, Africans of the diaspora canon. Uh, so our work is there and available for, for the future generations. Mm -hmm. It's so important to, I mean, it's interesting because you just think, well, what else have young actors or theatre makers not heard about? Because mm -hmm. if, you do, if you have not archived it, then it doesn't really exist. Right. And I, I mentioned in, in our sort of prep meeting that we, we at the Arts Council in co collaboration with Kwame Kweyama, with the National Theatre, had sort of did a call and said how many pieces that had been produced plays that have been produced for the stage are out there, and we thought maybe 50, over 315 still counting, mm. that have been produced since the 1930s in Britain. So you think, well, what's happening in Africa? What's happening in the Caribbean? What's happening in South America? What's happening in the Americas mm -hmm. in terms of how 
are people accessing our work and how are they able to go and curiously have a nose around? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the lecturers don't have access to it, the students don't have access to it, the critics, who are just as important to this, this conversation, mm -hmm. also don't have access to it. So that they also then learn how to critique the work outside of a European lens. I don't think they've started that. I think it's something I'm quite passionate about. I don't think they've started. I think they're aware of it because people are starting to re-look at theatre through different lenses. And there's, I don't know if she's in the audience, but there's a lady um, from the UK called Dawn Walton, and she started a really interesting writing initiative where she's getting writers to rewrite the narratives mm. around what they see as black in theatre. And I'm just really quite excited about what this will look like because she's got a really interesting bank of people working on this and you know those are the sorts of visions and projects and initiatives that need to come out they need to be linked to lots of things there needs to be lots of things going on and i think we as a world need to support each other because you might find that someone in america is particularly good at a particular genre but you might find someone in South Africa is good at another genre, and in terms of helping develop the critique, mm -hmm. it's really important. And it's important to have these conversations about the art itself, because yes. we don't do enough of this in the performing arts. Absolutely. Visual arts, they can talk for days about their work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you get an opportunity to really debate the work without thinking, oh, I can't really say anything about that theatre maker because he's my mate and I don't want to mess up. Mm -hmm. what's what's going on between us. I saw a play recently and I didn't think it was particularly good and everybody didn't dare to say, really say it out that it wasn't particularly good because he's a really famous playwright mm -hmm. and you don't want to upset him but there should be a space to critique the performing arts and theatre a lot more mm -hmm. in the way that visual arts have really rigorous critique yes. and they really dig into it. We yes. don't do that as much in the performing arts. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to I want to make sure that we leave time for questions from the audience for the panelists. Right. Um, okay. And uh, I, yes, I'm Manuel. Um, my last thing I have been thinking about a, a real strategy to work together, and because I think the diversity is not only inclusion, must be action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we can talk to. Giorgio and Derek and Teresa <laughs> <laughs> about if about if we have if we can have a line special line the name is African Diaspora Theater mm. uh, and we can make special meetings each year like this when we talk about the voice the body the conception of the th of the theater the image the history from our experience mm -hmm. and not only us because I work translate um, plays from the Caribbean play writers, mm -hmm. but I would like to translate uh, one of your plays mm -hmm. or one of your plays mm -hmm. and uh, keep in touch with other African communities mm -hmm. around the world, around the diaspora. Yeah, That's my so idea. we create a pan-African <laughs> community. I love yeah. it. OK, so I, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So there are mics uh, floating around. Raise your hand. And if you would, please just say your name so that we can um, honor you with, uh, with your name the way that you're honoring us. I believe names are honor, so. Down here. The question down here in the front. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. My name's Gary English. Uh, I'm really curious about the experience of the Swedish African actors uh, in uh, Raising the Sun mm -hmm. from the perspective of the journey you refer to for them. Mm -hmm. um, because the panel is dealing with issues both of diaspora and in the reality of post-colonial mm -hmm. uh, situations. I, I suspect those are very different. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very interested in, in whether or not you think there is a theater developing about the psychological transformation of people coming out of the post-colonial or diaspora limitations. In other words, is there a play about the actor's experience in Raisin in the Sun? No, but there should be. <laughs> no, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think um, 
the experience of a raisin in the sun was an example. Let me be very clear. There is talent and there is history within Sweden. We are producing, even at um, theatre high schools, uh, actors of diverse background, absolutely from both Afro-Swedish and other minorities. But they're coming into theatres, they're coming into institutions, and the, th the plays are not there. Yes, uh, yeah. the journey, we had, for example, the possibility of doing the, you know, the making of a raisin in the sun. Mm. You know, and I chose not to do it because that would be the first time those actors go through that. Mm. And that is not for the film. Mm. That is for them to carry themselves and then to have control and ownership over that. Mm. Um, I think the bigger question for us now is what we do next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's true. And the biggest question really, which is where I agree with Manuel, would be really to bring together others because what we discovered was that there is a huge um, desire to meet others. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke very briefly to uh, Sonja about this, that um, for one or two of the actors, it was like coming out. Mm -hmm. It was understanding not just the Cinderella complex, but actually who I am and what I gain from that. And mm -hmm. what they are doing now is disseminating their journey to others. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, no, there isn't a play, but there is definitely ongoing storytelling now mm -hmm. uh, that is ricocheting even as we speak, again and again, more and more. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the strategies is how we hold that. We're now discussing the radio play mm -hmm. of A Raisin in the Sun, but recontextualized uh, in support with the Hansbury House uh, to revisit it through Travis's eyes. So we go backwards and forwards. Um, the next thing then is to produce the book of it as well, which contextualizes the whole thing. So it's not just a desktop, you know, oh, this was nice, but any student, etc., can open that book and understand how it was made, etc. So I thank you for the question. It should have been, but it's in them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the best book of all. That's the best play is them and mm -hmm. them going out and saying, you know what I did? Do you know what I did, where I was, mm -hmm. and who I did it for? Mm -hmm. So, um, but you never know what else happens afterwards. And other plays, <laughs> the other thing. Others, others, there are other stories are. waiting. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, we have one center aisle here. Okay, sorry. Um, I just, I'm, every, I'm so moved in so many ways. Um, by this conversation and the absence of it um, and the importance of it. I'm curious about a couple of things. Um, the first one is, I think, Nike, your comment about the importance of archiving. If, you're, if it's not archived, it doesn't exist. And I know I work in communities, a lot of communities where there's not a lot of resources, but there is the insight to archive that story. What I'm curious about is what the networks are that are in place to sort of house those archives and how, how they become a network for exchange. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the strategies of taking those basement archives. Like my husband has like huge archives of, you know, uh, grassroots pieces that have happened for over 12 years, but they've been sitting in the basement. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, and I see other individuals, uh, per, you know, usually folks that are already kind of connected to universities, you know, have their archives in the universities. I'm just curious about where do you archive, how do you keep them sacred? And then that trickles into my second part of the question, which is how do we, how, I'm curious what the panel thinks about continuing this type of dialogue in a pan-African setting. Mm. Um, because what happens when you continue the dialogue, but then it's not in those pan-African spaces? Mm -hmm. um, and what is, what is, what the impact of that in terms of taking it out of that sacred uh, ritual space. And I know who you are, but just tell everyone else who you are. My name is Shay Cage. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll let Nikkei oh, respond. Nikkei? I think that's a really good question around the archives. I, I, when we worked on the project, we worked with the BNA Theatre Department, we worked with the National Archives, we also worked with the National Theatre. And we also work with individuals to understand how to archive, how to sort of rummage around your own family's attics and all the sorts of questions that one needs to ask. And what was really interesting, and on parallel, there was somebody in, in the United States that was doing a similar archive around photography that was coming from the, the African diaspora. So he was sort of going around the States and asking people to contribute photographs around a particular moment in time. 
And it was interesting because he also was on this journey of archive. I, I think the National Theatre did something recently with Asian artists to do a similar archive of their of their work, theatre work. I, I think I think it's a big question. I think it's about speaking to, starting with the low hanging fruit, the universities, the community spaces, but really ensuring that they understand how to ensure that the archive isn't just sitting in a box somewhere. Mm. It gets used. You want people to use, you want people to respond to it. And I think, you know, even going in to speak to um, heritage and funders and different organisations that can help you pull together a network. But I think this is a really big conversation that, as part of growing this conversation, we should be having, we should be thinking about, well, actually, how do we make sure that these archives are all linked to each other and we can support each other to find homes for these archives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even and if that I home is a digital home, yeah? So, sorry? If, if, if that home is also a digital home so that it can be accessed. Yeah. Yeah. And what's really interesting, and I was in, um, I've been doing some work in the Gambia, West Africa, and I kind of did some research for them to see like who's funding them. 80% of their work, their funds were coming in and it was around sort of like organizations like the British Library archiving their stuff and holding the archive. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, you can't have them holding your archive. <laughs> you need to have some kind of control over it. But they said, well, well, we don't have the funds. They're paying for the archive and they're housing it. And I said, well, we all know what happens you know, no disrespect, but we know what happens with the British Museum in terms of when they hold the archive and then it becomes part of their archive and not right, ours. Right. And so it's really important that the spaces that they're that are holding it are, are, are safe spaces mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. archive to be, you know, carefully, you know, investigated and managed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, there are, there are also, um, within every country, I'm sure, some kind of archiving network we also have, which I think is an important part, is the digitalization of what's mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. Even these discussions will be sent out, live beamed out, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think that one of, ironically, maybe one of, this is my gut reaction, is don't go to a theatre first. Mm -hmm. Go to the museums, go to the archive galleries, go to the places that also work digitally, because I think that digital space is also uh, much, much more accessible. It's uh, financially much more accessible. It's also much more accessible in terms of a global market. So I would certainly suggest that you looked digitally at how to do that. There's also the talent and the knowledge out there with much simpler systems of archiving. And it means so many more people can get access to it and it can remain sacred. Mm -hmm. And it can remain in control as much as is possible. Mm -hmm. That would be my, I hold, I'm with Nike as well. I mean, it's a much, much bigger conversation because it is about ownership too. Mm -hmm what happens to it. And it would be, you know, digitally obviously much more expansive in terms of what the content mm -hmm. and everyone, would be everyone. Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions there were? Yes. Thank you. Right down here. The last conversation actually triggered something else in me. Um, I work for the National Please Endowment. Please tell us your name first. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Victoria Sands. Thank you. And I work for the National Endowment for the Humanities. So the questions of preservation and archives yes. are uh, very um, important to me. Um, and I think the, the importance of maintaining, even if digitally, um, a platform and expanding access to archives um, also demands um, knowing how to make sure that the preservation processes wow. migrate as mm -hmm. the technology changes mm -hmm. so that you don't lose the ability to read the information that you've, mm -hmm. you've kept. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a huge question. Yes. But I had another question about ownership that had, um, it, and it's for anyone on the panel. Um, how much do you think that ownership is tied to physical places um, and performance in those more um, uh, permanent or ephemeral, um, but it, is that sort of anchoring in a physical place uh, crucial to the kind of in inclusivity and uh, ownership that you all are um, uh, trying to achieve? Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> no, um, um, the Riksteatern, which is the National Touring Theatre of Sweden, doesn't have a home. We tour constantly. We get rather a lot of state money, and we are never in one place. 
So we are constantly looking to reevaluate what the space means, what's the concept, the idea, why is, why, what is the raison d'etre, really, in the stories that are happening. Personally speaking, I think that we are all feeling that the house is not necessarily the best space anymore. We are having to recontextualize our work. We're having to expand it out. Cinemas are becoming theaters. Streets are becoming education sites. Mm. People are no longer coming to these buildings as churches anymore of creativity. They are going elsewhere. So I think in that sense, one of our greatest challenges uh, that we kind of meet at the Rixtiathen because we have to tour 360 degrees of the, yeah, 600, yeah 660 yeah, degrees, yeah. Oh, all over. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Um, means that we have to reanalyze the space. And the space is a political arena, let's not pretend. It is a power, it's a position, it's a, it's a macked, it's a power position. I have a house, I have money, and the money is put into that house. I charge tickets, I charge, people have to come in. And I say this with full open heart, I sit in a theater myself, but I don't think we need them all the time. I'm sorry, because if it's the real, if it's the real thing about changing humanity, then it is not in a house. Yeah. It never was. We need them, we need them, don't get me wrong, but for me, it's got to be more than that. Otherwise, what was the point? If it's just this building, what was the point? Mm -hmm. Manuel? Um, um, sometimes when the people ask me what I do, I, I say I work in a contradiction. Because I work in a city, in a, pro, in a theater program on a university, but this city has not theaters as, as a place. Yep. Uh, but always, we found a place where we can do something. Yeah. But the better is always the people comes to see us. This is most important. When we finish each um, show, we think about the idea was important. The idea for meet, the idea to discussion, um, or to stay together, um, to see uh, something, to think about the life that's important always. Mm -hmm. In Buenaventura, I learned that we, know we don't need a space physical. We need idea. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. Maybe because I'm coming from Africa, Africa, and then other people are, are talking about f being descendants of Africa, mm -hmm. living somewhere. You know, I mean, if, it's, if, it's, if you, you can feel what I'm saying, to say, people are saying, oh, we are in a European country, but we are of African. But I'm like, I'm from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to say they are saying we need to run away from these spaces, but we are saying we need those spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get it? Mm -hmm. Why? Why do I say so? I mean, we are going to have a conversation again with Gideon's play to say we had uh, instruments put in place by the government, which then doesn't allow you to speak freely mm -hmm. outside those theater spaces. Mm -hmm. So, like Paul Sai and I, and censorship act. So if you then go ahead and say, oh, we don't need these spaces, okay, import them to Zimbabwe, <laughs> reduce them, because I think we, we speak freely and we think we own most of our stuff or our rights, or we can do whatever that we want in those spaces. I mean, just a, just a, just a point that I thought I need to, to share with you. No, I you might say, oh, we need ideas. Yes, we have ideas. But if you go out there in the street, the police and the soldiers will come and beat mm. the hell out of you. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. a, it's an excellent point that you're making because it speaks to the idea that, that um, there's not one answer for everything because black isn't monolithic. So there's not one answer that's going to fix every single problem. Where we are. Exactly. Exactly. If you come, I'll invite you to, to Zimbabwe. Come with me. Yeah. <laughs> so we have bring my house with you. I'll bring my house with me. Go ahead, just you one more thing you want to say? No, no, it's just the, the question the lady brought up as well um, was, you know, it's also under the, under the title we have. Exile, migration, mm -hmm. and belonging. Mm -hmm. You know, where the house is. You're absolutely right, and where it isn't. Mm -hmm. Where it's needed, and what mm -hmm. of those houses become. Mm -hmm. So I think absolutely, it's connected somehow. So I do want to add, I do want to add, I absolutely love the Rick's Theatre model. I just think it's smart. I think in terms of my approach, I'm very interested in taking that approach with the African festival I'm doing. And in terms of what we're trying to shift on the continent, I think it's something to explore. I hear you, um, I hear you, um, Lloyd, about what you said about the spaces, because I hear it from a number of African theatre and festival um, producers. They've talked about wanting that space. But I think in terms of like Nigeria, we have maybe one or two national theatre spaces, and for us to sort of wait for that building to happen, 
we're not going to be getting the great plays mm. and the great productions and really interesting, innovative approach to theatre making that you're seeing coming out of like Lagos in particular right now. And it's because they haven't got these spaces and they're really recognizing that it can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really like the approach. I love the fact that you have to constantly reevaluate because I think sometimes with Africa, we look to sort of people who colonized us and say, well, we want it like that. But actually, mm -hmm. sometimes we, because we're still in that space of development, we can sort of jump ahead and, and avoid some of the mistakes that have been made mm -hmm. and just yeah. take different mm -hmm. approaches that are really working and that are driving new new ideas and new ways of making um, making work and i just i just remember when a friend of mine went to um he went to the congo and it's just after the sort of it calmed down after the war and he was saying he felt ashamed because all his cousins the people in the market everybody had a mobile phone and he never had a mobile phone but he was a freelancer working in uh, new jersey and people could never get hold of him until he got he checked his answer machine and he said you know I, I, I'm going to Africa thinking that I'm going to be doing them a favor, and they they were teaching me a hell of a lot of things. <laughs> and I think there's things that we do in Africa that make us really innovative in our approach just because out of necessity comes invention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is why I really like this Rick's Theatre approach. I think it's really interesting in terms of audiences, in terms of the perception of spaces and people feeling like they don't belong to certain spaces because, you know, this is not for people that look and behave like me. Mm. I think it's really interesting that a number of the big institutions across the UK are taking satellite spaces in different communities in order to get the work out and mm. bring in the audiences mm. because they know the audiences won't go to those big spaces. So mm. I think this, I, I would love to hear us explore it more in terms of the way we make work within the African diaspora and how this can really fit into something bigger. Yeah. You know, we've got the archives, we've got the critics, we've got the spaces. These are all really important to making work. Yeah. Yeah, and so obviously we could go on and on and on with this conversation, but um, I want to encourage everyone, um, our panelists, with the exception of Nikkei, we miss your spirit here, Nikkei, um, will be available. Just me a draining and I'll feel better. Okay. <laughs> will be available um, afterwards and throughout the conference, so I encourage you to come up to them and, and continue the conversation on your own. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. I think we, I think we scared them. Good job. Good job. And the translator. Yes, wow. Olga. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It was great.